Are you going to fall asleep during my presentation? <laughs> Are you ready? Nothing. <laughs> you seem awake. Okay, that's good. Let me try and revitalize you after lunch with my talk about team structure. So I'm Valeria and I work for Kelly Daily, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later about my company. Before talking about marketing, and I do appreciate that this is a CMO conference, so we're all sitting on the other side of the fence, I guess. Let's try and step back on the other side of the fence and see how the rest of the organization and possibly the rest of the world considers the marketing team. I mean, <laughs> my parents, they still think 90s and they still think that I'm pretty much like that. So a bunch of very young people, pretty confused about life and jobs and very, very good, apparently, at spending money they haven't earned. <laughs> now, I've got a breaking news for you, because actually, this is true. <laughs> Why this is true? Because we are young. We are forced to stay young as a marketing department. We have to be always ahead of the trend, ahead of the curve. We need to understand what we can do to interact with people, with our consumers more and more. And I come, my whole experience is from consumer brands, so I do apologize for people more into the B2B. Then, let's talk about the confusion. Why are we so confused? I've identified a little bit the typical challenges that uh, marketing teams can face nowadays in life. First one is variety of channels. So, it happens more and more often that you see CEOs coming to, to you, to the head of marketing, to the marketing director, asking, oh, wh when are we going to have Pinterest? And you're thinking like, really? You are the, C the CEO and you're asking me about a channel. Since when the channels have become a shortcut, a substitute for the strategy? So this is a very, very interesting point because there is a lot of pressure of channels and maybe not enough pressure on strategy. Although we are guilty as charged because every time I meet with my fellow marketeers, I've got these two best friends, both of them Austrian, both of them very no-nonsense, we're always like bragging. Oh, my channel is bigger than yours. Oh my God, my channel actually the interaction lasts long. So we're guilty. That's true. We have created our own confusion. And then to end up about you know the final part of the Beverly Hills gang, spending money. Long gone are the times when we could measure the return on investment based on awareness. These times don't happen anymore. And uh, I'm actually going to share with you a piece of my private life. Here we go with the story of my life. Um, I started my marketing career in Italy very, very long time ago. And I realized very, very soon that it was very difficult for me as a marketer to operate in that environment because there was a global recession and there was quite a lot going on in terms of company cutting their, their budget, as we heard this morning. So I decided to move to new pastures and I moved to the United Kingdom right on time for the 2008 crisis. Now, whether recession or crisis is true or perceived, I think I, I come to the realization that always and more and more in this constant environment of challenge and being chased, we are required to deliver commercial return on investment based on sales, based, based on number, and not only based on brand sentiment. <coughs> By the way, I'm not the bad luck charmer, and also they've created Brexit exactly to get rid of people like me, so that's great. <laughs> Which means that with all this challenging, we really do need to rethink the way we approach the marketing structure. But before then, we need to rethink exactly how we want to approach the marketing processes before going to the team structure. So let's uh, just have a quick look at the process management. In the Smith's songwriting, the customers are becoming more and more demanding. They ask, how soon is now? They want us to make decisions fast because their need state changes. 
and they are very demanding, as we said, which means that we need to rethink our approach to timelines and deadlines. And in this case, this is a proper deadline. So we end up being really petrified because we need to deliver something meaningful to the consumer, but we don't know exactly how to do it. And also, going back to our Croce and Delizia, data. So majority of the decisions have to be data-driven, which means that we need to start thinking differently about how we can measure the results of our activities. And for us creative people in the room, I think the word measurable has got quite a lot of affinity with the word miserable, because we think that our creative effort is going to end up being really um, trivialized, I think, by the commerciality of it. But this is not true, because I think if we operate a switch in our thinking, we can actually gain a greater understanding about our consumers, as well as a greater reward in terms of how we operate. So we need to have a look at how we rethink the planning cycle of our campaigns and whatever activity we're involved in. Uh, could be, I don't know, branding exercise or more commercial activities. Which means that we need to harness some information and try to break down the process cycle into something which is measurable, easy to digest, and that's conducive as well to a minimum viable product. This is a term which of course is borrowed from the IT technology, and um, who would have thought that actually marketing people are borrowing things from our binary friends, but it does happen. So the minimum viable product, what it is, is actually operating within a structure a frame that um, allows us to achieve for each of the single components of the big process some achievable, measurable results. So that will allow us to fail, for example, because we can test straight away. So if, we, if our long-term planning is actually the car, but we, we come with a skateboard as a first minimum viable product, we can test it and we can see how the consumer is responding and if we like it and if we don't. Which means that it's very easy for us to understand how we can get on and develop our long-term proposition, adjusting to the needs of the consumers that keep changing. Now, I want to talk to you as well about health. Not hell, health. Because being Italian, I think, you know, this is my heritage, I really do think that there is a, a great advantage in being challenging, healthily challenging, with, with, within the framework of cooperation with other colleagues. Which means that being the devil's advocate is actually a very, very important thing. When you plan your cycle of activities and you break it down in small, digestible, little tasks, it means that there is more space for people to put their distrust on the table if things are not working. And there is a space and time confined for feedback, being positive and being negative. And it's very, very important to be always challenging the status quo. Think of my business, for example. Um, as I was explaining to the Botox gentleman this morning, no, he's not here, but anyway, you should have seen me before the Botox gentleman. I was <laughs> much older. So basically, um, my business model, you might not be familiar with the name Kelly Daily, but we are a very successful franchise retail model. So we, we have uh, fully serviced uh, sushi bars within supermarkets in 10 countries which means that every time I'm thinking about the marketing conundrum, I need to think about, we have consumers, all the people who walk through the supermarkets and hypermarkets every day in 10 countries. But then, on the other hand, I've got the client, I've got the retailer. The retailer is my client, waitress is my client, is the, Carrefour is my client, and I need to serve them. But also, I have a plethora of franchisees who need to make their own margin out of the product they sell, and they need to make sure that the business is viable because they are on the front line. Now, if we don't foster the culture of being the devil's advocate, we can come up with an amazing marketing initiative, great product launches that they might be serving just one of the three parties involved. So we end up jeopardizing the very delicate balance between all the different needs within the business. And you can, I'm sure that thinking about your own businesses, you can find three or four or even more internal or external stakeholders that we need to serve in order to understand what in the planning cycle could go wrong and make amends and make adjustments, leading to a better use of resource, resources <coughs> as well as budget. So, sprint cycle. 
how do we then break down this very, very big marketing mammoth task into something which is easy, digestible, as we say, breaking down where everybody feels encouraged to share their own opinions and share as well whatever feedback they might have. It's as simple as that. It's called Sprint and the name says it all because it's quick, because it's energetic and because it allows us very soon to close the circle. And it's based on four different uh, moments. The first one is planning. And planning um, in this way is not only done according to vision. There is a lot of talks, especially if you watch TED talks and so on about vision, about you know, being led by marketing, big thinking, big pictures and so on. My challenge is that we need to start actually planning according to hurdles, according to problems, according to future disasters that we might foresee in our mind. Because first we put it out there and then we can test the potential solution for all these problems, which means that we can actually serve the devil's advocate. Once we have tested different solutions, we come to what I call the check stage, which is take a step back, sit down, observe, relax and understand what is working, what is not working, and especially within this little part of the whole process. Are we serving the end goal? And if we are not serving the end goal, is it not better maybe to go back to do and maybe test another solution? Which means that then when we move forward to the act and implementing the best solution, we're then ready to go to the next phase and then ready to go to the next phase again. So the sprinting cycles is actually done <coughs> for every little task within the marketing process. Which means that again, we can save money because we are not thinking about, oh my God, we need to do this amazing strategy right now and it's gonna come to fruition in three years time and then in three years time we realize that, for example, there are many other different channels. Think of all the people who wanted to do something on MySpace and they created a five year strategy. What happened to them? <laughs> I don't think they are in this room. So, the Spring Cycle allows us really to think critically about what we want to achieve, how we want to achieve it, and how quickly we want to do it. Very interestingly, we can actually borrow the same principles that we use for the Agile planning, and we can lend them to the teams, because I cannot walk into a room and say, guys, from now on we change our way of operating. It doesn't work that way. There is a lot of resistance, and um, based on my personal experience, resistance is actually not age-related. So it's got nothing to do with the age of the people, because as well there are loads of uh, talks right now about hiring people who've got a flair for digital, people who think digital and so on. The age <coughs> sometimes is not really related to the resistance that you can find and the traction within the business. Fostering an agile culture within your team helps us a lot because it helps psychologically to create an environment where everybody feels they can be thriving. So how do we apply these agile team principles to our own little marketing world? So as I said, we need to be devil's advocate and we need to be customer centric. So we need each of the parties involved, they need to think critically about who they are serving of the external stakeholders. And they also need to think who they are serving <coughs> about their internal stakeholders. So for me, being a head of department, I think my clients are actually my team. And my responsibility is to break down this big vision into something that they can understand, they can relate to, and they can execute without any doubts. And this is something that I feel I need to do in order to help them out to understand and to commit to what we're doing. So simplicity is the key. Again, the tasks whether they're big or small, they need to be divided into something that is pretty intuitive and uh, can gain the commitment of the whole team. So we need to make sure that everybody gets the consensus and they are straight behind the task and they understand how they want to operate it. Change is welcome. So again, what I realize is that there is a lot of tension in putting the distrust on the table when it comes to marketing planning. Partly because of the money involved, partly because there, were, there used to be an assumption that marketing was based a lot on uh, personal flair, on pride, <coughs> on uh, um, creativity and all these attributes which might not be measurable, as we said. 
But if within the sprint cycle we confine an area, which is the check area, for people really to analyze and to say, yes, this works, no, this doesn't work, I don't believe in this, and so on, we actually create a free space, a duty-free space, where people can actually talk openly about what they like, what they don't like, what they believe, what they don't believe. And it's very important because if we manage to reason with the team and to let them understand that actually this might not be serving right now the minimum viable product, but it's actually on the right path for the longer term, maybe they will be motivated again. So change is very, very important and criticism is, should be very much welcome. And then again, we were talking about frequency of delivery. So making sure that the spring cycle is actually followed not only because it represents an interesting way of doing things, but also because it represents a great motivator. Because if I start feeling that, that I am productive, I become automatically more productive. It means that I actually am eager to do more and I'm eager to complete more of the little task because it's almost like a little tick box exercise. You, you close the sprint one, you can move on to the sprint two, and so on and so forth. So you feel more and more confident in your own ability to meet the deadlines. Now, this is a very interesting topic. Um, I've been lucky enough in my professional life to work for businesses, great businesses, where face-to-face um, -face communication was um, encouraged at the point that we weren't actually allowed to send emails to our own colleagues. If, we're, if they were sitting on the same floor. So when I joined that specific company, which I can tell you is Cafe Nero, and it's a great, great company to work for many, many years ago, I thought like, oh my God, what is that? Are they crazy? And then I realized. I realized that um, our founder at the time uh, was really interested in promoting communication and solving the clashes within the business, within the floor plan. So making sure that if I have a problem with sourcing, if I have a problem with supply chain, I can go and straight talk to them. And if there is no one in the room that can help me, I can actually reach out actively. I think we're all guilty as charged on this because think of all the emails that we send and let's think for a second about the, the real purpose of the emails we send and if it really reflects the subject on the email. <coughs> So many, many times we end up sending emails because we want somebody to, wear, to be aware of something and so on and so forth, which is perfectly legitimate, but again, doesn't really solve the agility problem. So in order to promote speed and a lean management, we need to make sure that also face-to-face -face communication and just like clash, resolve and move on is quick and done also in an effective way. And then self-organization. And this is again really about psychology. Because if the task is self-contained and it's very, very easy to understand, it means that people, grassroots, they can decide how they can organize their time, how they can organize their workload, their teamwork, and so on and so forth, which leads to people and teams feeling more and more empowered and feeling they can give a meaningful contribution to the business. And then, of course, pause, reflect, and adjust, as I said. And this, this is exactly as I described earlier on, making sure that at some point, a given point in time, we stop and we're all able to look at the sprint cycle, minimum viable product, whatever thing we're doing, in an area which fosters being critical for the sake of being positive, for the sake of moving on. So now, I think it would be quite mad of me telling you about the right structure, because the right structure, in fact, cannot exist in a marketing team. Every organization is different. We all have different budgets, different destination markets, totally different way of operating. But I can tell you one or two things. So data and analysis, again, not only from um, an organizational point of view, but I think that having people who are highly numerical with the sheer intelligence within the team, helps us a lot rebalancing, because it means that it removes the pride out of the decisions. It, remo it removes that um, creative streak that sometimes can become really detrimental, because if we measure creativity against creativity, we're not gonna get <coughs> proper measurable result. 
But if we measure creativity against numbers, we have a very neutral way of comparing our own effort. Then content planning. So I was really interested because um, last night we were having um, uh, dinner and I was sitting at the same uh, table with Merck, with Attila, and uh, we were talking about content planning. So we shouldn't be slave to content. Again, we shouldn't be slave to channels. So what he was saying to me very interestingly is that you decide what your story is and then regionally you can decide the types of channel that you can use. So as long as you have a very strong content, then you're free to use it and cherry pick it, considering each of the single different, I don't know, situations within each of the international business, for example. So again, we shouldn't be slaves to, to contents and channels shouldn't be really substituting the strategy. I will close this conversation just talking about um, what seems a bit like a paradox, a contradiction in terms, because we're talking about efficiency and saving budgets and saving resources, but then I'm recommending to have a, a team or a resource dedicated to pilot, and a team and a separate resource dedicated to rollout. Why is that? I do believe, and this is again from a pure group psychology point of view, that if you de-risk the pilot execution, if the people who are in charge of the pilot just think about delivering the pilot for what it stands, that frees up quite a lot of observation, which means that we are free to see exactly how it works. If you charge the pilot people with as well the responsibility for the full rollout, they will be just thinking about getting things out of their desk and moving them to the next stage and not because it's viable for the business, but more because it's just their task, tick box again, they want to do it. So I think it would be quite healthy to keep pilot execution and full rollout in the hands of two different individuals, who of course can learn mutually, and as well, you know, depending on the different situation, they can actually switch and swap. So just to finish, we're not definitely perfect, but we need to look more at how we can be efficient and rewarding. Because if we go back to the Beverly Hills picture, I would say we are young, for sure we are very good looking too, but we also know what to do with our confusion and we are not so bad actually spending money if we only apply a couple of different principles. And that's it for me, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? We have a few minutes. Hey, and um, when you have, so one of your other roles, or with Kelly Gale, when you've been sort of implementing these agile type structures and set up to your projects and things, has that always been into an existing agile structure, or have you sort of implemented that? And then how would you, how easy is it, or not easy as such, but what sort of steps would you take initially to start easing yeah. the company into a more agile way of working? It's a, it's a very, very good question because the struggle is real. <laughs> you, you really have to win hearts first and then minds. There is no way of just going to the team and say, hi guys, I've thought about this amazing thing, it's called Agile, it comes from IT, and people are thinking, like, what does she want? She's supposed to be a creative. So what I usually do, I tend to relate to people and to the department more on a personal basis and try to guide them, take them by hands and let them understand that we, what we're actually doing is serving the purpose of the, of the full company. Because I think as well there is a lot to say for um, um, structures, organizations, especially within marketing, believing into doing something which could be extremely expensive and so on. So sometimes you have to say no, but I think that when you start implementing slowly, slowly and you foster ownership of projects, that's why these projects have to be smaller, so even the more junior team members can have an ownership that will sort of like spiral into something better and bigger. So have you been able to sort of implement that gradually? Yeah, sometimes? it has to be done. It can't yeah. be done like overnight. Yeah. It has to be done. Um, somehow it's easier, of course, with new team members. With all team members, you really need to sit down, explain and so on. And again, as I said, it's not really age related, nothing to do with age because there are very young people who are extremely resistant to change. So, yeah. Mm -hmm.
Hello. The, can you describe one particular campaign, that Agile circle, just, you know, what, what did you do for X? Yeah, I might not go specifically to my current um, role, but we had retail world currently is quite challenging. So being uh, in my previous experience with Cafe Nero, we had quite a lot of pressure of delivering results quickly, especially as the Christmas campaign was approaching. So sometimes you do your big Christmas planning, which starts in February and then finishes in June. In June, it's boiling hot, you shoot the product, melting cakes and so on. And then you're ready for the campaign. And then I'm thinking about two or three years ago when Black Friday started becoming really big, we had to implement something which was quick easy and wouldn't jar with the big spirit of the campaign. So we started brainstorming about what quick fixes we could do right now and we found that lots of things could be done on the app, for example. And that implementation was quite key because if we wouldn't be thinking critically about what wasn't serving the purpose of getting more people through the door, we would have ended up just having this amazing campaign and not really serving the purpose. So I'm becoming more and more a fan of this, especially because being in the consumer arena, I think the, the, the speed of response has to be quite immediate. And you know, sometimes it's also quite interesting because you can almost create a toolkit beforehand if you think about all the problems. Of course, you know, this is a very interesting topic because we are all supposed to be very positive, but sometimes thinking about the problems beforehand of course, you can't foresee everything, but there are a few things. Now, for example, Black Friday is pretty mainstream. It wasn't like that in the UK a few years ago. Now we know, and so we can move on. No? You, uh, well, maybe one question. Do you find, um, so Agile is a, is a, has been a technology, an IT-driven methodology. Do you find <coughs> that, I, I think, that helps sometimes IT teams hide behind the process? Do you feel that you're given, uh, is the process respected in the marketing team where you work and where you've implemented it, or do people say, no, nah, we'll just interrupt that process and we'll become involved, or do they respect the process that you're doing? Well, I believe that um, marketing people are not quite like the IT people. So IT people might sort of like hide behind the process while marketing people they up to a certain extent they are paid to be disruptors so and i think it's really up to us to understand where the disrupt the disruption comes from and try to contain it okay you can talk about the disruption but just in this phase so it's really about how you can maneuver i don't want to put it sounded like bad but i think it's really how you contain this big emotional streaks that usually come from uh, all the creative people. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.